Welcome, everybody. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are, whether you're local here in San Francisco, around the country, or maybe even around the world. This is the beauty about virtual. We can gather anywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, but you know what? I've got a lovely backdrop here. I've got some jellyfish, of course. My favorite place, the Cal Academy of Science, which is, I think, your favorite place, too. And that's why you're joining us here tonight. And happy Earth Day, by the way. And we thought we'd have a nice virtual celebration and events a fundraiser with the capital F. We'll have some fun things indeed. Uh, but thank you so much for just taking the time to be with us here virtually uh, to celebrate our wonderful and special place, the Cal Academy uh, of Sciences, which is my favorite place. Let me introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Franco Finn, and I am a local born and raised native of San Francisco, uh, and I've been uh, actually going to Cal Academy of Sciences since I can remember, really, uh, since as a child. And uh, through my adult life, of course, through nightlife uh, and all the great events that the Cal Academy of Sciences has brought forth. Uh, I know we're uh, in a weird time and a strange time, but hey, the Academy is open once again. And so we're excited about that. And so I hope you can join us at some point whenever you feel safe, vaccinated and everything like that to jump, come visit your favorite place. And, and the reason uh, I'm here too is uh, not only am I just a huge fan of the Academy, but... I am also, uh, you know, a local guy, grew up just a stone's throw away, but I'm also uh, a hype man. And that's what I'm going to bring, some hype here tonight. Uh, you may have seen me in the last 20 years as the hype man for your Golden State Warriors, uh, from Oracle Arena to now the new Chase Center in San Francisco. You know, things are turning a corner. we got fans coming back Friday night for our first game uh, since the pandemic. So lots is going on, but I just love bringing some energy and fun to, you know, these great events, these fundraisers. I'm a professional auctioneer, too. And so I know together we're going to come uh, and have a good time, enjoy, and learn about, of course, the Academy's uh, new mission and the vision for the future. And that's what we're here about for the first part of the program. And then just means teasing at 8 o'clock. Now, 8 o'clock is going to be phenomenal. After our program, we're going to kick off our after party with a special performance from Chromio. Now, if you don't know who Chromio is, I tell you, I've uh, listened to their music uh, for the last several years now, and they are amazing. So definitely stick around for the after party at 8 p.m. with Chromio. And of course, we're gonna hear from some other folks and special guests here as we have our wonderful fundraiser and gather together. This is a spring forward science soiree, and we're gone virtual, but we're gonna have uh, a good time. We're gonna enjoy it. And I see the chat already blowing up right now. This is amazing. Say hello. I'll give some shout outs. We already have some gifts coming in. This is amazing. And we just barely started. So feel free to put something out in the chat. Let us know you're here and representing and that you love the Academy. And so now let's officially kick things off. I cannot wait to get things going here for tonight, our spring forward uh, science soiree. I'm going to introduce now the Cal Academy Board of Trustees Chair, Ms. Levy Patterson. Levy, take it away. Good evening and welcome to the California Academy of Sciences and our Spring Forward event. Thank you so much for joining us. After an incredibly challenging year, we're overjoyed that the Academy has reopened to welcome you, our community, back inside. Months ago, we made the decision to keep this year's Spring Fundraiser a virtual event in order to involve as many people as possible as safely as possible. We hope you'll visit the museum in person soon. In addition to your favorite animals and attractions, we have some new exhibits, including Big Picture, a celebration of global nature photography. Venom, all about the planet's most venomous and fascinating creatures. And Sharks, featuring some of the ocean's most majestic and misunderstood creatures. The theme of tonight's gathering is Spring Forward. And as we look to the future, there is so much reason for hope. While the past year has brought to light huge challenges around social justice and environmental threats, it has also inspired a surge of people who are actively participating in healing human and ecological communities together. As part of this process, Academy staff have been engaged in deep conversations about how we can move forward with the greatest impact at a time when the world faces enormous and complex challenges. As a result of these discussions, we are launching a new mission and major new initiatives. You'll hear more about this in a moment. Before that, I want to thank everyone who made tonight's event possible. 
Thank you to all of our generous sponsors who made this event free for all to attend. Special thanks to our event lead sponsor, Autodesk. And please join us following the program for our after party, generously sponsored by Carmel Partners. I also want to recognize the Academy staff who have worked tirelessly over the past years to keep the institution we all love going strong and ready to reopen our doors to you. It is this kind of dedication from our staff and community that first inspired me to serve as a board member. And it has been my honor to serve as the board chair for the past three years. As my term comes to a close, I am so proud of the bold new direction the Academy is taking at this critical time in our planet's history. And now to tell you more about exciting changes afoot, I'd like to introduce our Executive Director, Dr. Scott Sampson. Thank you for all your support, and I hope you enjoy the evening ahead. Thanks, Levy, and a huge thank you for your exceptional service to the Academy as our board chair. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Spring Forward, a science soiree. Connecting communities is at the heart of the Academy's mission. And if events of the past year have taught us anything, it's that people working together can have a powerful impact. Among the many heroes who have strived to keep us safe and informed during the global pandemic, scientists have been at the forefront. I am so proud of the contributions Academy scientists are making to a healthier world. And we appreciate your commitment to growing the next generation of science and conservation leaders by supporting our work. Thank you. We're living in both challenging and hopeful times. Today, we sit at the intersection of three crises, climate, biodiversity, and social justice. The best science tells us that if we're gonna co-create a thriving future, we must make major progress in the coming decade, this decade. That's why staff from across the Academy have been working to develop a bold new purpose and strategic direction. The major crises we face share a common core. All are linked to the idea of human dominion, in particular of white people over people of color and the natural world. If we want true social and ecological health and justice, we have to reject white supremacy. And we must lift up the voices of people of color, partner with indigenous nations, and collaborate widely to develop solutions that serve everyone. We are committed to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within our staff and volunteers and in the many communities we serve. This is a long-term institutional commitment, and we are now partnering with a consultancy by the name of the Mosaic Collaborative to help guide us in this critical work. I look forward to sharing more with you soon. Earth is home to millions upon millions of life forms, Yet, in the geological equivalent of an eye blink, human activity has heated up the planet and torn countless threads from the web of life. Our decisions and actions in the coming decade will have major consequences, and we can't push solutions down the road. Just ask anyone who's experienced California's wildfires, Texas's deep freeze, or the barrage of hurricanes in the southern U.S. Disasters previously dubbed once in a lifetime are becoming annual events. The good news is that we humans have the capacity to halt these social and ecological crises. We simply need to decide and follow through. And this brings me to the Academy's new strategy. We have an important role to play in this great work of our time. To start, we need a more positive story the kind of story that can inspire people around the world. A story rooted not in despair, but in a thriving, regenerative vision of the future. So, what exactly might a regenerative future look like? It's about healing environmental damage that humans have caused over hundreds of years, and which has accelerated dramatically over the past 50 years. The Academy's new strategic vision states that Within a generation, the natural world is healthier, more resilient, 
and wilder each year. That's our goal. So how do we get there? Consider this. Imagine if people partnered with the natural world instead of working against it. Imagine if we didn't just stop the degradation of nature, but reversed it, regenerating the health of ecosystems worldwide. This type of thinking gave rise to the Academy's new purpose, our new mission. We regenerate the natural world through science, learning, and collaboration. Regenerating the natural world is arguably the most pressing cause of our time, and today it is what the Academy stands for. We are thrilled to have the Academy back open, and we look forward to seeing you here soon. Be sure to check out our new mission statement as you enter the museum. And coming up, I'll tell you about the Academy's three major new initiatives. But up next, our staff put together a short video summarizing the ways that your support helps us each and every day. Thank you, and please enjoy tonight's program. Wow, that was really special to see all the signs and the beautiful faces and everything. And uh, thank you, uh, Levy, for kicking us off. And of course, Scott, uh, this is going to be a special night indeed. And uh, really great to see everyone coming together. And speaking of Scott, I just want to say happy birthday to our executive director. So happy birthday, Scott, to you. Uh, I know you would love to be here celebrating in person, but you know what? We're here also for you as well and the Academy. So happy birthday to you, my friend, our executive director, Scott, uh, celebrating his birthday tonight on Earth Day. Wonderful. And so uh, let's keep it going for Scott and for the Academy and everyone here tonight, uh, especially in our fundraising. Now, take a look at our thermometer right now. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. We're already almost at 40 thousand dollars and we're not stopping there i know it uh, i'm going to use this uh oftentimes is the strength in numbers mantra as what coach kerr you know head coach of the golden state warriors said hey it's strength in numbers it takes everyone in the building to come together 
participate, be a part of the movement and be champions, not only on the court, but off the court. And so I know we're going to be champions in our community. And uh, indeed, we're going to be raising some money. Look at that. Let's get to 40,000 and then some. We do have a goal of $150,000 tonight. And it's just that simple. Uh, you don't need any bid paddles or anything like that. This is really super easy. You just see that green button on the bottom right hand of your screen, that donate button right there that's going to live there throughout the program. Just click away like some of you already have done so. And they're coming in. We're so close at 40000 Come on, everybody. Let's get us over the hump. Now, click that green button to raise some money. Our goal is 150000 But guess what? We have some friends that are going to do an amazing match tonight. We have, if we do, 50000 which we are so close. We just got over 40000 Let's keep it going. Less than 10000 to go. The first 50000 raised tonight will be matched dollar for dollar by our friends at Autodesk. So thank you. Thank you to Autodesk, great partners and sponsors of our wonderful science soiree. And look at this. We are at almost 41,000, just 9,000 to go. And we're going to unlock that 50K to match and get $100,000. Yes, total for the night. And then so we're going to keep it going. And so thank you again to Autodesk for that 50K match. I know we can get there. So let's get it going. We're at 42,000, everybody. Keep this momentum happening. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of tonight's sponsors and, of course, the trustees of the Academy. Thank you so much for helping keep the Academy extra special. Uh, and uh, you know what? We're all here because this is a special place. I've said it before. And so now we're going to hear back from Scott Sampson. Scott, take it away. As part of the Academy's new strategy, we decided to focus our efforts on three powerful initiatives. Tonight, we're excited to introduce them. Hope for Reefs, Thriving California, and Evolving Islands. Why do we choose to concentrate on coral reefs, tropical islands, and the state of California? Because all three tap into our existing research expertise, ongoing activities, and scientific collections. All three are hotspots of biological diversity and home to numerous threatened species. And all three have great potential to be global models for expanding ecological literacy, community engagement, and conservation solutions. With our Hope for Reefs initiative, we aim to reverse the rapid decline of Earth's coral reefs in this generation. I can't overstate how important this is. In the past 30 years alone, half of all reefs have disappeared. These marine ecosystems aren't just beautiful, they support 25% of all ocean life and the livelihoods of more than half a billion people. In phase two of this initiative, we will bolster global coral reef resilience and advance high impact interventions from sustainable fisheries and marine protected areas to on the reef restoration all implemented with local communities and cross-sector stakeholders. As climate change turns ocean waters warmer and more acidic, corals are struggling to reproduce. To save species from disappearing and restore reefs in the wild, scientists are trying to crack the code of coral reproduction, starting in the aquarium. I'd like to introduce Academy scientist Dr. Rebecca Albright to tell you about her cutting edge research in our coral spawning laboratory and what it takes to grow baby corals. Thank you, Scott, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Happy Earth Day. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I just wish it was in person. Tonight, I have the pleasure of sharing with you my role in one of our exciting new science initiatives, Hope for Reefs Phase Two. So some of you may be already familiar with our Hope for Reefs initiative. It originally started in 2016 and over the last five years has resulted in amazing scientific discoveries and advancements, many of which are summarized here. So just to highlight a couple of them, we have launched the largest and most active scientific rebreather diving program in the world, enabling exploration of twilight reefs and discovery of numerous species, some of which are on display in the award-winning Twilight Zone exhibit at the Academy. We also created an award-winning planetarium show called Expedition Reef to bring coral reefs into the hearts and homes of millions of people. 
And we've worked internally and with external partners to advance reef restoration and conservation, including launching at the time one of two facilities worldwide to successfully breed corals ex situ. And so this work, the Coral Spawning Lab, which I lead, is what I'd like to share with you tonight. So many of you are probably aware that coral reefs are experiencing unprecedented declines in health worldwide over the last several decades. And when we think about how to turn this around, there are really two fundamental biological processes that are critical to regeneration. And those are growth and reproduction. We have to be optimizing growth of existing individuals to continually add biomass to a system. And we have to be replacing lost individuals and adding to the population through successful reproductive events. And in my lab, these are the two main processes that I study. So the majority of coral species reproduce sexually during once a year breeding frenzies that we call coral spawning. When many corals spawn by releasing bundles of eggs and sperm into the oceans in synchronization with their neighbors, and the eggs are fertilized in this kind of underwater spawning blizzard. And unfortunately, as populations decline, this critical reproductive process is breaking down in the wild. So we're searching for ways to keep this reproductive pathway intact and to shepherd corals through these critical life history stages. So one of these efforts is the Coral Spawning Lab, which I started a few years ago in partnership with Steinhardt Aquarium to advance protocols for predictable spawning in a land-based setting. And at the time that I started this project, we were one of two places in the world to be doing this type of work with the first successful project launched by Dr. Damie Craggs at the Horniman Museum in London. So this once a year reproductive event is tightly regulated by a variety of different environmental cues, but there are really three to four variables that seem critical to triggering the timing of this event. So most corals spawn in late summer, after a full moon, a few hours after sunset. So as scientists, we have to accurately simulate seasons, lunar cycles, sunrises, and sunsets in the lab in order to get the timing of this event right. And we do this using sophisticated software and a combination of lighting regimes and temperature controllers that allow us to program in sunrises, sunsets, moonrises, moonsets, the day of the full moon, the day of the new moon, average monthly temperatures, in order to make these corals feel as much as possible like they're experiencing these environmental cues in the wild. And so I just want to share with you a brief video chronicling the evolution of this system over the last couple of years. So because light was such a critical variable for us, the first thing we had to do was actually build a room within a room to avoid light pollution and have complete control. And then we sent a team of researchers to Palau to sustainably collect colonies. We never take an entire genotype off the reef. And once these partial colonies were collected, they were packed by our aquarium team and shipped from Palau 36 hours to San Francisco where we integrated them into the system and started to watch for spawning behavior. And as you can see from this amazing footage, these corals actually spawned at the same time as their wild populations in Palau, which was a really exciting milestone for us from a conservation breeding standpoint. So at this point, we have two cohorts of babies the first one of which was uh, born in 2019. They're now two years old, approximately 10 centimeters in size. And we're actually monitoring those babies to see if they spawn with their parent populations next month in May. And last year was the, in 2020 was the first year that we had corals that were brought in from the wild in 2019, spawned in 2019 at the same time as their native populations stayed the entire year in our system with us mimicking all of those different environmental cues and then spawned again in 2020 at the same time as their populations in the wild. And again, from a conservation breeding standpoint, this was a really, really exciting milestone for us and for the cats as a whole. So as we look at phase two of Hope for Reefs, a top priority for me in my lab is to continue building on this success to further grow and develop the system with the goals of continuing to advance conservation breeding techniques 
advancing fundamental coral research. So to date from this lab, we've produced what is currently the best available coral genome in the scientific community. That's currently pending publication. And I have an incredible new postdoc in my lab, Dr. Laura lopez Vandom, who's using that genome to ask some fascinating questions related to the ability of corals to adapt under rapidly changing conditions. We're also using the system to test a variety of restoration questions with the hopes of identifying ways that we can enhance growth and survival of coral babies and translate that knowledge to the field through our partnerships with organizations like Secor International. And you can even imagine a scenario where we might have multiple staggered systems so you could actually facilitate spawning corals several times a year, advancing the pace of scientific discovery and conservation by orders of magnitude. So the spawning lab is only one component of our approach to reef regeneration, which is a mixed portfolio of strategies that includes deeply collaborative cross-sector work in partnership with Autodesk and Seacore International, which is a nonprofit reef restoration organization, to infuse technology and science into field restoration efforts and reduce bottlenecks so that we can scale impact and keep pace with rates of environmental loss. And in addition to our commitment for advancing reef regeneration, phase two of Hope for Reefs builds on all of the incredible work from phase one to further our commitment to scientific exploration and discovery, cross-sector collaboration, community engagement, and environmental learning to advance coral reef science and regeneration in meaningful and impactful ways. So thank you so much for joining us for this evening. Thank you for your time, for your energy. And I'd love to take this time to introduce the Academy's Chief of Science, Dr. Shannon Bennett. Thank you, Rebecca. I feel like coral love is in the air here and all around the world, hopefully. This is very exciting and impactful work. So to reach a healthy and thriving future for reefs, but for the rest of us as well, we really must tackle the twin threats of climate change and biodiversity loss. There are millions and millions of unique species on Earth, and we're losing them at an alarming and accelerating rate. The best science tells us that we must stop this rate of biodiversity loss by 2030 to avoid dire consequences for people and the planet. And I know this sounds alarming, but we already have the tools, the knowledge and inspiration to address the challenges before us. The video you're about to see highlights how the Academy is working to build healthy communities and a thriving planet, fueled by foundational science, global education, and transformational partnerships across California and around the world, and importantly, how you can engage and join us in supporting this work. As we emerge from a world-changing pandemic, the Academy is ready to tackle the combined impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss, which threaten the world's wondrous array of life on Earth. We know that time is short, and we're rising to the challenge with a plan for building a healthier, more resilient, and wilder world together. So a healthy community and a thriving planet, they go hand in hand. And the Academy is making that a reality through a three-pronged approach. We use science focused on biodiversity to understand the interconnectedness of living systems. Then we connect people to the science and to nature in a positive relationship. These trees are big, so I thought we would think in terms of a 10-story building. And finally, we find solutions together through collaboration. We have a lot of exciting programs here in California that engage communities in community science. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. More eyes on the ground means we're really empowered to track nature together and how it's responding in terrestrial systems, in our backyards, in marine systems, and everything in between. This is turkey tail. We always put teachers at the heart of much of the work that we do, whether it's here in California or globally. In the Gulf of Guinea, we've worked closely with teachers to 
formalize in the curriculum an understanding of their local biodiversity. We help them design curricula to teach COVID safety through the lens of their own biodiversity mascots. If we're going to think of new ideas and include more people in the process of conserving life on Earth, then we have to have more diverse voices. The Cal Academy has an emphasis on diversity, access, quality education and inclusion at all levels, ranging from early education to elementary school, middle school, high school, undergraduate, graduate students, even postdocs and beyond. The thing I'm so excited about is building a cohort of biodiversity leaders globally. So what started as just teaching students to help me do ant research ended up being a program to teach the next generation of entomologists in Madagascar. So we will have to walk for at least a day to get to We can't talk about how to conserve and sustain a forest without first addressing immediate social issues like hunger and malnutrition. I realized edible insects. 70% of the people of Madagascar still eat insects. What if we could find new species that we could mass rear and kind of augment their diets? Have programs at school where they rear edible insects for their lunch programs. So you could ask, why would edible insects address biodiversity? It's a tool, and we can apply this tool to help reduce bushmeat hunting of lemurs. We can address nutrition because insects are loaded with micronutrients. We've demonstrated that we can have an impact on people and biodiversity. By contributing tonight, you are supporting the Academy and our partnerships across California and the world to find critical solutions to climate change and biodiversity loss. Our goal tonight is to raise at least $150,000 to fund Academy programs in biodiversity science, environmental learning, and collaborative engagement, to drive conservation solutions and to revitalize connections between humans and nature. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And now, here's Andrew Anagnost, President and Chief Executive Officer of Autodesk, with an exciting announcement. Autodesk is proud to be a lead sponsor of the Academy's Spring Forward event in support of its mission to regenerate the natural world through science, learning, and collaboration. I encourage you to join us in supporting the Academy's critical work as generously as you can. Tonight, Autodesk will match your donation to the Academy dollar for dollar up to $50,000. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, Andrew, wow. Uh, the folks are coming in here hot, I love it. We're almost at 118,000 because thanks to you, Andrew and Autodesk, $50,000 was matched. We surpassed it, we made it 100,000 and it's still climbing right now. We're at 117,000 and some change. Keep it going, ladies and gentlemen, this is wonderful. Thank you again to Autodesk for matching that. We're so much closer to our goal of $150,000 plus. I know we can do it, strength in numbers tonight, any amount, whatever it may be. That green button is right there living on the bottom right hand of your screen. Just click at any point. This is amazing. I love it. I want to do my option thing so bad. How many dollars on it? Let's go. How many dollars? Let's go. 150,000. Let's go. We need, to, we need to crush it. And I'm glad that we're giving it right now. 117,000 plus. Thanks again. Click that green button and then you'll see all the ways you can help support, of course, the Academy, our new mission, and uh, also the fund, the Academy programs in biodiversity science. Things like environmental learning as well, collaborative engagement, also to revitalize connections between humans and nature. This is what we are doing at the Cal Academy of Science. That's why I love it. And that match, it's amazing. I'm hyping it up right about now because we are almost there. We're at $118,000. Do the math. We're so close to $150,000. let us keep it going. We're not done yet. We have a very special behind-the-scenes tour right now with Laura Eklund, who is our collection manager in anthropology. So Laura, take it away. What a great night so far. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at tonight's Spring Forward virtual fundraiser. I'm particularly pleased to welcome you to the Anthropology Collection. And that is where we are now. We are in one of the collection rooms back of house. 
Many of you know that the Academy actually has a very robust research division, and that includes eight departments, all of which have research specimens. These are specimens that come from around the world and across time, and they help us to understand biodiversity on Earth. Tonight, we're going to just look at some anthropology pieces. And I would like to highlight native California. The area that we currently refer to as the state of California was actually very densely populated, as indeed it kind of still is. And native Californians, there were a number of small tribes, um, but there were very many of them. And they had a lot of similarities in terms of culture and linguistics. And they also, of course, had their differences. So one thing I want to start with is something that's quite rare in native California, and that is pottery. Pottery is something you find all around the world, but you don't find it very often in California for reasons I'll get to in a moment. These pieces are from the southeastern portion of the state down in the Mojave Desert. And I just want to show you, for example, this ladle here. You can see they've designed it. They've painted on this pretty red design here. And on the back of the piece, they've actually taken the time to paint both sides. Now, you might notice there's quite a bit of breakage and some fire marks on this piece. All the pieces in this drawer here survived the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire, which many of you have probably heard of. And the Academy lost a lot of our collections at that time. And as you can see, the pieces that did survive sometimes were damaged. I also just want to mention that you're going to see some empty spaces in these drawers. And these are pieces that are either on display at other institutions where we have sent them for loan, or they're down in our prep lab where they are possibly going to go into the new collections gallery that the Academy is developing. We're really excited about the collections gallery. It's going to highlight all of the departments and all of the collections here at the Academy. And it is currently slated to open in February 2022. So we look forward to joining you there in person. Now, I mentioned back to native California that pottery was quite rare. Instead, a lot of tribes, in fact, a majority of them, used basketry. And they used basketry for everything from collecting food to preparing food to storing food. A lot of food. We all need food. And we also have baskets that are actually watertight so that they could actually carry water in the baskets. Now, a lot of times people wonder why there wasn't more pottery in California. And one of the main reasons is practicality. So to use a modern day example, would you rather carry your beverage in a heavy, breakable travel mug or in a lightweight aluminum mug that if you drop it, it bounces for the most part. And the basketry is the aluminum equivalent of the pottery and the ceramics. If you are living a nomadic or semi-nomadic lifestyle and have to carry your belongings with you, I think most of us would much rather carry a lightweight, flexible, less breakable basket than pottery. So these baskets are quite beautiful. A lot of them are utilitarian, of course. You can see this basket, for example, has feather work on it. We've got the black are quail feathers from California quail, and the red are woodpecker. But something that a lot of people don't realize about these pieces is that in addition to their just being pretty or utilitarian, is that they can actually can be used as biodiversity examples. So for example, the plant materials used in these baskets would have been collected fairly close to where the baskets were made. And therefore, you can extrapolate data about plant materials or animals based on how often they occur in the baskets and when and where those baskets were made. I want to show you one more piece before I leave you for the evening. And that is an earring from right here in Northern California. And that earring is designed in the shape of a flower. And this flower has six petals. This dates from about 1900. But if you notice, the petals are actually T 
teeny tiny little baskets. So they have woven six baskets and then sewn them together into the shape of this flower. This earring is made entirely out of woodpecker feathers, save the metal hook. And it's just a wonderful and beautiful example of the expertise of native California basketry. So with that, I'm gonna send you back to enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening. And I'm gonna send you back to Scott. The Thriving California Initiative addresses the dual threats of climate change and biodiversity loss here in the Golden State. We'll mobilize our vast scientific collections together with the power of big data, cross-sector partnerships, and crowdsource community science to track California's changing ecosystems. We'll seek to dramatically boost environmental learning here in the Golden State and work directly with communities to co-create healthy alternative futures. I'm pleased to introduce Amy Miller, our Director of Public Programs, to tell you about plans for culturally relevant science and nature-based programming featuring California's unique biodiversity, aimed at reaching millions of children, adults, and families here in California and around the globe. Thanks so much, Scott. Hi, everyone. As Scott mentioned, I'm Amy Miller in Public Programs. My pronouns are she and her. You've heard about the very exciting new Academy strategy, mission, and an overview of the three strategic initiatives focused on islands, California, and reefs. Rebecca beautifully revealed the importance of biodiversity science in regenerating our natural world. I'm going to spend a little bit of time tonight talking to you about environmental learning and its importance in California. While each of these three initiatives takes a unique approach, rises from specific academy expertise and assets, and are tailored to serve unique communities, I am particularly excited about Thriving California. Like the California Academy of Sciences, I am a Bay Area native and grew up here. I grew up coming to the academy and my favorite animal remains the two-headed snake. I don't know if anyone remembers that guy. He's still on exhibit today, even though he's in a jar. The academy has a long history of collaborating in the state to further bi uh, biodiversity science and environmental learning. I'm going to share with you a few Bay Area examples and how we will scale them to the state level. Our education efforts throughout these three initiatives will be rooted in environmental learning. So what we mean by environmental learning is that it is broadly accessible, hands-on science that emphasizes biology and astronomy. We aim to impact the head, so boosting people's understanding of the natural world and their role within it, and the heart. We want people to create an emotional connection with nature, leading to actions needed to protect and restore the natural world. So let me give you a few examples from San Francisco. So our first example is the Bayview Science Institute. This is a partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District and schools in the Bayview neighborhood. It's a collaboration between teachers and academy educators to develop science curriculum and hone science teaching strategies that meet the needs of students and teachers and further science learning. This program has fundamentally changed the way that science is taught in schools. Another example are our science action clubs. These are science kits designed to be used after school and get middle school students outside. These programs provide meaningful connections to science and nature including coaching and mentorship for after-school leaders and support students as they investigate the natural world. Students leave more excited to learn about science and nature and the providers now have the confidence that they need to include science in their programs. Dear to my heart is the nature play. <laughs> These are nature play activities conducted in the gardens of the academy. Picture activities like insect investigation. So kids use scientific tools to carefully collect and observe insects. Another example are using natural materials to create ephemeral arts or even fairy houses. In addition to these activities, there will be new, a new nature play exhibit that opens in the East Garden in the fall. We're all very excited about that. These activities provide guided explorations of nature while academy staff and volunteers mentor caregivers and expand their comfort level in and with nature. In other words, we're building environmentally engaged communities through pine cones and hand lenses. The City Nature Challenge is a community science program 
started in 2016 and encourages community members to go outside to collect biodiversity observations and data. By observing and documenting what they see outside, participants are connecting to their natural world in addition to collecting data for science. The City Nature Challenge has become an international success story. And these are just a few examples that we're currently involving um, environmental learning efforts. So let's talk about what we're gonna do next. So where are we going? So these are some examples of how we're gonna scale these efforts to have measurable impact in California. Building off of the Bayview Science Institute, we will identify potential school districts within California where we can build similar professional learning partnerships, the focus on supporting teachers, delivering environmental learning, and further changing the way science is taught in schools. Building off of the careers in science and science action club efforts, we will develop a youth leadership network throughout California, connecting youth and their mentors together to engage in meaningful nature-focused civic action in their local community. Building off of the nature play activities and the new East Garden Playscape, we will design and launch nature clubs in San Francisco and link to other nature clubs within California. Nature clubs support and guide families as they explore and fall in love with their local nature. Building off of the community or citizen science efforts and the thousands of enthusiastic volunteers who serve at the Academy and the Natural History Museums of LA and San Diego, as well as serving at the California zoos and aquariums, will create a volunteer network connected to the natural world around them. Our goal is to mobilize this statewide network of nature volunteers to help us document and protect the biodiversity of California. I hope you are as excited as we are. We are really proud of what we've been able to accomplish so far and cannot wait to scale these environmental learning efforts out of the Bay Area and to the entire state as we launch the Thrive in California initiative. The outcomes of truly connecting Californians with nature will lead us to healthier communities and a thriving state. Thank you so much. Back to you, Franco. Thank you so much, Amy. And uh, I'm just proud to announce right now our fundraising goal. We're at 124,000, almost 125,000. Let's keep it going. We're just 25,000 away. I know we can do this. Come together, strength in numbers as Draymond Green from the Golden State Warriors just flexes muscle like this. I know we can flex our muscle as well. Let's get those uh, donations going. The donate button is right there, the green button. Thank you so much. Look at all the people in the chat right now. It is just amazing, all the support here tonight. 126,000, we are almost there, but let's do a fun little thing here. Uh, I have something that I, I wanna give out here on behalf of Alaska Airlines. Uh, by day, I manage our external relations there at Alaska Airlines, helping out the community. And I just said, you know what? My favorite place, the Academy, needs a pair of Alaska Airlines round trip tickets anywhere we fly. Uh, and I'm talking about Hawaii, Mexico, Costa Rica, New York, you name it. We've got new locations like Montana and uh, beautiful places, intra-California, wherever you want to go. The beaches await. The summer's around the corner. Let's get some round trip tickets on Alaska. There's this flight. It's going somewhere. I hope you've got it. And here's how to do it. It's called the virtual hero, but the last virtual hero. We're going to put up $100 that you see on the screen right here. Now, you got to be just the last person to bid $100, and it's just going to add up every time you click 100 Now, the whole point here is, of course, we're raising money for the Academy. We are almost to our goal. We're $126,000. But if you click 100 and you are the last one, when I say all in, all done, and sold, if you're the last one, you get two free our round trip tickets on Alaska, anywhere they fly, no blackout dates, almost good for another year. Actually, the booking deadline a year from that, and then another year to travel. So two years, you can travel wherever you like. Hey, we've got destinations, leisure destinations awaiting you. Who's ready to go? All right, so Mary kicks this off. Kristen, oh my gosh, says, no, I've got the last $100. Are you going to be the queen of the last virtual hero, Kirsten? Or is, oh, Denise comes in. Now, Mary, if you want to come back in here, now you've got to be the last one when I call it. Now, we're going to put a shot clock and timer on it because i got to move on to the next segment here. So let's go. Gia, you are in right now. You're at the top of the heap. Remember, every time you click 100, it's another 100 going to our wonderful Academy 
here. So Gia, you are in at 100. You are the last one right now. But Mary, Kirsten, Denise, are you in? Are you going to go above and just put another 100 and be the last virtual hero to save the day and actually get those round trip tickets on Alaska? Look, this plane's already about to leave. We don't know where this one's going. Who's ready to go? Jennifer. Oh, is it Jared? Oh, is it Jennifer? Oh, is it Shannon now is coming in the mix. Now, here's the thing here. you got to be the last virtual hero. So we're going to put a shot clock on this. Okay, 60-second shot clock is about to begin right now. Now, Rebecca now is in the lead. Nisha, I see you. Shannon, uh, anyone else? How about the other folks earlier on? Don't let it slip away. Now, Rebecca, you – oh, my gosh – we got people pledging and giving right now. I love this crowd. It is truly spectacular. I cannot believe it. Kirsten, there we go. Kirsten is back on the scene. And I'm just telling you, she wants this two round trip tickets anywhere to fly. I think you're ready for vacation. So here we go. The shot clock's about to go. About 30 more seconds left. We got to close this thing. Now, Denise, Denise is sneaky. Just came right in there. So this is the last virtual hero, of course, is the last push. But you can donate at any point during the night. But let's put a little prize to it, right? Let's get it going. Two round trip tickets on Alaska is going to someone. Nadise, now you're the last one here. Now we've got to put a 24-second shot clock, just like the basketball game. And there's going to be a buzzer beater. It's going to go to 0-0 at some point. So when I call it, you've got to be the very last one. But remember, every time you click, it's going to keep adding on to your bill tonight. But, hey, we're doing this for the Academy. So let's get it going. We're about to wrap things up. Is it Mike? Is it Justin? Is it Kirsten? Is it Denise? Let's get it going. Less than 10 seconds. Are you ready? Who's going to be the top of the heap? Let's get it going because when I call it right now, you want to be the last one. Now, Barbara, yeah, I know Barbara wants to get in on the action as well. And so does Chris and everyone right there. Now, Barbara, don't let it slip away. Now, I know we can do this. We're getting there. 128,000. Let's keep it going, everyone. Is it Raquel? Is it Raul? Here we go. We're going to have to close this right now in five, four, three, two. Ladies and gentlemen, get the last second and we are going to close it. Gia Barcy. Wow, I tell you, you got to be ready to go. All right, thank you so much. Gia, congratulations, and thanks, everyone, for playing the last virtual hero game. Now, that was a lot of fun. I hope Gia is on her way somewhere, and boy, she's already got her pa her bags packed. Well, I hope you sip a little pina colada or a little Mai Tai and save, save me one, by the way. All right, so thank you. Congratulations. Uh, let's have some fun. And I love this. This is just a community. Look at this, 129. We're almost at $130,000. And guess what? This just in, ladies and gentlemen. Andrew from Autodesk, who you heard from earlier tonight. Uh, basically is saying we're going to add another $50,000 to be a full match, another 50 k because he is so compelled. Andrew, uh, you are so amazing, but we got to get this right now to the edge. You're going to give another 50000 I think, for Autodesk so we can get over the top. So we're at 140 almost and just a little shy. But we need another 50000 so let's go. So Andrew can throw in another 50000 from Autodesk. Let's surpass this threshold. I know we can do it. Remember, that green button is right there at the bottom. Thank you again to Autodesk. Thank you so much to Andrew. We're going to get to that. I know we will. We're going to match another 50 and unlock another 50,000 so we can give it to the Academy. And what a great night so far. So let's get it going. Of course, the after party, 8 o'clock with Chromio. Don't go anywhere. Our headliner, lots more surprises. We've got a sand artist that's going to be unbelievable. We also have the tour of the universe with Ryan Wyatt, the senior director of Morrison Planetarium and science visualization. And then we got some other fun things ahead. But now let's get right back to our director, uh, executive director, Scott Sampson. Way to go, everybody. Thank you so much. Scott, take it away. Our third and final initiative, Evolving Islands, builds on more than 100 years of academy research on the world's tropical islands. These islands literally brim with unique and amazing species. Tragically, 75% of recent extinctions have occurred on islands, and up to 85% of their remaining species are threatened. On the plus side, islands are ideal for conservation interventions, with simpler ecosystems that respond faster to these efforts. We'll be focusing on five archipelagos, the Galapagos, Lesser Antilles, Madagascar, Philippines, and the Gulf of Guinea. Key aims include establishing new protected areas and conservation policies, 
training a large and diverse cohort of youth leaders and working hand in hand with island communities to empower and implement solutions. One of the success stories from our island's work is found in Madagascar, where the Academy is building capacity for an innovative program that tackles biodiversity loss together with poverty and food insecurity by farming edible insects. To tell you more about this project, here is Academy scientist, Dr. Brian Fisher. Thank you, Scott. A great intro to my world. And I wanna share that world with you. It's a world maybe that's on your bucket list. We all wanna get to Madagascar. And as a biologist, I've always wanted to get there. And that, tr that chance came about 30 years ago when I first went to Madagascar to begin exploring my love, the world of ants. Now, the story is really a story about the origin of the Breakfast for Conservation program. It's a story that really highlights the role of collection-based science. And by partnering with the right organizations, having an impact on the people that need the forest. And it's really the only way we'll find out that actually saves the forest. It's a win-win for the people. It's a win-win for conservation. But my story begins really with my first trips to Madagascar to explore the ants. Now, when you go to Madagascar, it's great. You want to visit the forest, but to get there, it's an adventure. It's an adventure that actually we spent more time getting to forest than actually going to the forest. But once you're in the forest, it's why we're biologists. It's really that experience of finding new things for science and that discovery. And as an ant collector, that meant kind of this routine that we've done to over 450 sites across Madagascar. We sample the insects in the leaf litter, in the trees, they walk around the ground, we catch flying insects that fly into these traps. But one thing about insects, there's a lot of them. And to really process that material and get it into our collection, we needed to form a team. So the first big team we formed in Madagascar was with students to train them to become biologists and to actually participate in our program. Luckily, the Bay Area supported our building of a biodiversity center, the Madagascar Biodiversity Center, where the project is housed. Now, as a biologist, the first thing that got me to Madagascar was the biology, the people, the, the forest. But it was the people that kept making me come back. And it's really sad to care about both the forest and the people and to go back and see a forest and have it gone. And it made me wonder, as a biologist, what am I doing? In 25 years, will there be any forest left? And I began to question, maybe I should redirect my research to also help the forest. And then the answer hit me. The answer was obvious. As an entomologist, the key in a sense was building on a tradition of eating insects. We formed the program Breakfast Before Conservation to build on that tradition, to add good science that we could actually allow those insects that are only plentiful during a brief moment of time, plentiful all year, to address this incredible food security that's threatening the forest. It's not just big corporations that may impact the forest. In Madagascar, it's decisions that are made by individuals to feed their families. And we can help that. We can use this great innovation of insects. For 300 million years of evolution, insects have figured out how to convert waste, so to speak, into micronutrients. And those micronutrients are better absorbed by humans. They help us build strong, healthy people that can be better learners in school and make it sustainable. They, have, they require far less water. They require far less feed to convert to protein. They can do that because they're not warm. They're cold-blooded animals that actually don't have to waste all that water on keeping their bodies cool. That's the beauty of insects. And also, there are lots of insects to choose from. So our first step, though, in our program in Madagascar was to travel the whole country and find potential insects that traditionally are eaten that we could actually farm to help biodiversity and people and then find the collaborators that could help us do that. The first 
was my favorite, the bacon bug. The bacon bug does taste like bacon, and it's the prized um, insect that everybody wants to eat. You can actually sell it if you grow it. You can feed your kids. And our goal was to grow it, in the bacon bug, to reduce bush meat consumption. To save the lemurs, we teamed up with a bush meat expert, Courtney Burgesson, and we've launched this program in one of the largest national parks in Madagascar. And we've, our project has shown that we can reduce bush meat consumption by 50% in the villages where farming edible insects. In addition, we wanted to actually address more large scope problems. And we turned to the grasshoppers and crickets to address the need for malnutrition and hunger. It, traditionally, it was those groups, grasshoppers and crickets, that allowed Madagascar to survive those times when they didn't have any rice or other food. We wanted to bring that back. To do that though, we needed a lot of science and we needed partners. We teamed up with a large company called Entomo Farms to train us on how to rear a native species that we found in Madagascar to be the cricket of choice to grow and farm. And we spent the last three years figuring out how to do that with less space, with less feed and with less time. And now we were in the last two years, we've been ready to move this out with partners that have an impact. One of our first great collaborators was to add our cricket powder to feed people in the TB clinics in the south of Madagascar to actually, and the polio clinics. And we've actually had an amazing response. The tuberculosis clinics, they wanted to expand across the entire country because those who ate the cricket powder responded better from treatment. They, had, they gained weight, and those who didn't have the cricket powder saw immediately that those who ate it were healthier and benefiting from treatment. Polio clinics, tuberculosis clinics, that's just one aspect of the importance of good nutrition. But also, what about the famine of Southern Madagascar? Famine relief is a big component of what happens in international aid, but it's a Band-Aid. They bring in food from outside and they feed people and then the next year they're hungry again. But what if we could actually grow the food locally, teach them to actually grow crickets, what they used to eat, especially in the south of Madagascar, and actually give them a tool that sustain them year after year. In addition, we expanded our program to school lunch programs across Madagascar. We teamed up with some of the best chefs in Madagascar to develop school lunch programs and we we're feeding kids across large cities, and also in the rural areas of Madagascar. Now, in addition, we had a bonus. We found out that the cricket poop, in a sense, the frass, we call it, is a fantastic fertilizer. In fact, in reforestation, we can actually have reactivate the soil. In fact, now we're using it in gardens and croplands of the local villages, where we can extend the use of these fragile systems so we can reduce the need for, for um, forestation. Overall, this program is a win-win, a no-brainer. And we hope that we can expand our program, not just across Madagascar, but across all of Africa. It's a win-win because it's sustainable. You can sell the product, you can eat the product. It's a win-win because it reduces bushmeat. It's a win-win because it extends the, the the cropland and reduces forestation. This is science-based, but it has an impact and it's gonna be a game changer in areas where deforestation and impact on the environment is driven by food insecurity. You may not have eaten food such as edible insects before, but I urge you to give it a try. It's only through these wide open ideas that we can actually change the world and I welcome your help in changing the world. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, that was fantastic. Bacon bugs. Hey, I'm ready for dinner. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Look at that. We're at 140,000 and we're about to close it out. But it is not too late yet. That green button right now, the donate button, please do so uh, because we are less than 10,000 short of our goal. And guess what? If we reach 150 tonight, uh, we, we have Autodesk that uh, really just has already been so supportive. They are putting in another 
$50,000. So, Andrew, thank you so much. Autodesk, you've just already gone above and beyond. So let's get to 150000 ladies and gentlemen. Come on, how many dollars? Let's go. We got 141 right now, almost at 142 Just a little bit more strength in numbers. Andrew and Autodesk, you are amazing. We want to reach. I know we can do it before the end of the night, but we got to get going uh, with our program. And hopefully you will continue to give throughout the night as we have some of our entertainment coming up right here in just a minute or two. And so thank you again for all your support. We are at 142, ladies and gentlemen. We can taste it. It is so close. Oh, yes, indeed. And so thank you so much. And everyone, Brian, that was amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experiences there. And uh, let's keep it going. Excited about the academies. Of course, new direction. And we couldn't do this without all of you. You guys have truly made a difference here tonight. We want to thank our speakers, everyone who donated uh, and tuned in wherever you are around the world, locally, around the country, uh, just taking the time to hear us out and just to have a good time and celebrate. Uh, this has uh, been a wonderful virtual event from start to finish, but it's not over yet. Remember, the after party is coming up. We have Chromio and some special guests. You don't want to miss out on this. And of course, uh, we want to just say, hey, the sponsors, and the community making this possible is really what it's about. Take a look at the sponsors you see right there, all the major uh, gift givers, those that understand the mission and the purpose of the Academy of Sciences. And, and, you know, as a young child myself growing up and going to this place, field trips, learning, and just uh, having a ball uh, and just being surrounded by it. By the way, my favorite is Claude, the uh, albino alligator. Yes, I know Amy's favorite was the two-headed snake, but I love Claude, the albino alligator. And so see the friends. Let's get it going. We are at 143,000. I know we have 7,000 more to go. I'm going to wrap it up and put a nice bow on it. Thanks again to Autodesk for matching another 50,000 when we're going to get to 150 here in just a few moments. So thanks again to all. My name is Franco Finn. It's been an honor and pleasure. Hope to see you all back soon at the Academy. It's open now for you so you can enjoy it. So now I'm going to hand it over to my good friend, Micah, Jesse, who is ready for us and been waiting in the wings and hosting this after party. Enjoy, everybody. Have a good night and happy spring forward uh, on behalf of Cal Academy of Sciences. Take care. Hello everyone, my name is Micah Jesse. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and 
human. <laughs> well, I was muted there before, so apologies for that. Welcome to the Spring Forward After Party. I'm so thrilled to be your MC for this portion of tonight's event. And a huge thank you to our After Party presenting sponsor, Carmel Partners. I love the Academy. Whenever I'm there, I'm just amazed with all the animals and the people and just the overall vibe. It's an incredible, incredible place. And I'm so excited about tonight's program and lineup. You guys, Chromeo is playing tonight. When I heard about that, I was freaking out. They are one of my favorite bands. I'm so excited about that. We're also gonna see Jeremiah from The Throw Zone as well as Ryan Wyatt from the Morrison Planetarium. But first, we thought we'd start off by wowing you with Anna Strelakova, who's going to show us her, the history of the Academy through her incredible sand artistry. Yes, you heard that right, sand artistry. Anna, take it away.
I am in awe, you guys. Wasn't that amazing? We are going to have more of Anna later on in the show, so don't go anywhere. We're so happy that you are here tonight, you and your families. Tonight, we're raising money to help preserve biodiversity, and we need your help. I'm going to take a look at the screen right now and see where we're at. We're almost at $145,000. I know that when we hit $150,000, we're going to get matched. So that is very exciting. Tonight, fund academy programs in biodiversity science, environmental learning, and collaborative engagement to revitalize the connections between humans and nature. What I want you to do is hit that green donate button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Our goal tonight is 200,000. We are so close, you guys. We've already raised 144,000, almost 145. If we get to 150,000 tonight, Autodesk is go has just announced that they're going to donate an additional $50,000. So thank you, Autodesk. And thanks to those of you who have already donated. Please try and help with whatever you can. Next up is Jeremiah Johnston. Jeremiah is one of the most talented jugglers in the Bay Area, and he's here tonight to impress. Jeremiah, take it away. Hello, I'm so thrilled to be here at the Academy of Sciences for the Spring Forward event. In the spirit of sharp teeth and my own long arms, I thought it was time to pull out the knives to start this off. So, try and keep up, here we go. Try this out. 
you you guys i am freaking out over that i can hardly carry my dishes from like the kitchen to the kitchen table that guy's amazing jeremiah incredible more from him later on in the show but first folks i'm so excited about this next part of our program get up off your couch and get ready to dance because these two will be bringing it electro funk duo from montreal here at the academy in front of our penguin habitat presenting dave one and p thug better known as chromio Yeah. Welcome to Spring Forward, California Academy of Sciences. Space, like an I'm on my face. 
Jones. Did the music stop? I don't know about y'all, but I was dancing throughout that whole set. That was so much fun. So amazing. Thanks, guys. Not to worry, those of you watching, there is more Chromeo from the Academy later on in the show. Now it's time to get out those wallets. We are so close to our goal, you guys. We, if you, if you love science, please support us. We want you to hit that green donate button in the bottom right hand of your corner. We are going to crown another virtual hero for $25. Just $25, we're gonna crown another virtual hero. The last person to donate $25 in the next minute and a half will not only be my best friend, but also our virtual hero winning a digital membership to the Academy 
and a $50 Academy gift card at the Academy store, as well as this amazing penguin art. <laughs> this is amazing. I am so obsessed. The penguins made this themselves. And it's actually on the back signed by Chromio as well. Um, so let's see the donations. I see some donations coming in. Amazing. All right. So we are going to start right now. I'm going to ask Alexa to set the clock. Alexa, put a timer on for 90 seconds. All right, y'all. The next minute and a half. 30 seconds. Starting now. Go. All right. We are raising money for science. If you love science, which we're all here today because we love science, we love animals, we love the universe, we love Mother Earth, we are donating money today to the good cause. If you love science and you want to support us, all we're asking today is to pledge $25 in the next 30 or so seconds. $25, we're going to crown another virtual hero. I see money coming in, donations coming in. All right. This is so exciting. All right. Where are we at with our timer? <laughs> I didn't have another clock. Okay. We're getting Shannon. We're getting donations of all sorts. Okay. Okay, I'm going to announce the winner in three, two, oh my God, now they're really coming in. I don't want to, I don't want to announce it yet. I'm going to wait till Alexa. Oh, wow. They're really coming in now. Come on, you guys, $25, $25. The last person is going to be our virtual hero. Oh my gosh. Now they're really coming in. Shannon, John. Okay, who's going to be the last one? Up. Oh. Alexa, stop. Up. Oh, oh. Our winner is Stephen Popper. Congratulations to our lucky virtual hero. Amazing. Later on, we're going to hear from Ryan Wyatt, Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization. He's going to take us on a tour of the universe. But before he does, we want you to comment in the chat box places you'd like to see tonight. Is it a planet, a constellation, or even another solar system? Comment and we'll pick a few places to go on tour later tonight. But okay, now we're going to go behind the scenes with our cute, adorable penguins and Holly Rosenblum, biologist with Steinhardt Aquarium. Holly, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Rosenblum. I'm a biologist here at the Steinhardt Aquarium at the California Academy of Sciences. I take care of our African penguins. Uh, we're doing some scale training and we're doing a feed this morning. Um, we, uh, it's really important that we have these guys here at the Academy to share with all of you and all of our guests um, because they are highly endangered in um, South Africa and Namibia where they're native to. Um, and that's due to things like overfishing. So it's really important that we can share their stories with all of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, the scale training that we're doing this morning is um, a really critical form of enrichment and training that we do um, so that we can take the best care possible of them. Um, Emma is tracking what all of them are eating as well. And all of that information can tell us um, how their health is in general. So are they feeling well? Do they need to see the vet? Um, but it actually tells us when good things are going to happen, uh, like if they're going to lay an egg or if they're going to go through their molt. So African penguins go through a catastrophic molt every year and they replace all of their feathers at once. Um, and someone who's gonna do that real soon is walking away from me right now. Tuli, this little girl right there with the dark gray back. And you can see that she looks a little bit different from everybody else. So Tuli is a juvenile. Um, she's just over a year old. And because she started gaining a lot of weight and she's eating a lot, we think she's gonna go through that molt. So they gain a lot of weight prior to doing that. 
Um, <laughs> because in South Africa, they obviously can't get in the water to fish if they're losing all their feathers, because that's what keeps them warm. Um, so for Tuli, it's extra special because she uh, will grow in a new set of feathers. Everybody's getting along great today. Um, she's, the new set of feathers that she grows in will look just like the adult. So she'll be an adult at that point. Um, and then hopefully, once she's got her adult feathers in, here she is. You can see she is very hungry. Um, once she has those adult feathers, we are hoping that she will match up with Tuck, who has a blue band on his right wing, and he is right behind me, waiting patiently. He's the only one that seems to be doing that today. Um, so um, for African penguins, um, we, uh, we kind of give them an, a, little, a little assist in the romantic department. So there's basically a dating service for penguins um, that's a little more scientific than the ones we use. Um, so uh, species survival plans uh, exist for many different species in zoos and aquariums like the Academy across the country. And we all work together to make sure that the population stays healthy uh, by making sure that we don't have close relatives reproducing with one another. Um, so Thule and Tux have been matched. And once she goes through that mold, um, then um, hopefully uh, they'll pair up. Hopefully they'll be into each other, right? A little bit of, little bit of science, a little bit of magic, a little bit of chemistry. Um, oh, trying to steal the mic. Um, and then, um, and then maybe we'll have chicks in the future from that couple, which would be great. And they'll go on to help support our African penguin colonies across the country. Um, so scale training is just one form of enrichment that we do. Um, we'll also do other things like add extra logs and rocks to the exhibit, blow bubbles. Um, anything that kind of makes it a dynamic environment. So you can kind of think about enrichment as choice, challenge, and change. Um, and then we do other fun things like make painting. So that makes uh, makes it kind of an interesting activity for them. They've got to navigate through, uh, through the paint and different textures and then onto the canvas. Um, but the best part is that we can share that with, um, with different people who can get uh, a little penguin painting occasionally. Um, we might all have a lot of them at our desk from different birds. Um, so we really just wanna thank you for all of our support of our African penguin colony. You can see uh, food is a, a critical resource around here. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, feed them uh, a wonderful diet without all of your support. So thank you for joining us at Spring Forward. We look, quest, uh, look forward to taking your questions um, and thanks for all your support and joining us. Bye everyone. Thanks, Holly. Aren't those penguins so cute? I think they have to be my favorite animals. I shouldn't pick favorite favorites, but I think they are. Uh, and it's so fun to see how they make these fantastic, unique pieces of art. Um, this, I just think, is so freaking cute. And it's going to be signed by Chromio. Amazing. If any of you have any questions about our African penguin, penguin colony here at the Academy, please type your questions into the chat box. And Brenda, one of our biologists, will try and answer as many questions as she can. Well, thanks to so many of you who've donated tonight. We are now at $145,703. So exciting, but we're not yet at our goal. So now for our second virtual hero of tonight, I had so much fun with our first one. I'd like to do it again. And this time it's going to be for two minutes. All right. And I know y'all waited till the end the last time. So this time around, the last person to donate $50 in the next two minutes will receive Penguin Art, this one right here, and a VIP package for Sky Star Wheel. Um, I am going in an $100 gift card from the Academy Store. I'm going to start the clock right now. Start. Okay. I want to tell you about this gift that you are going to win, this amazing, amazing package. You're going to enjoy the gorgeous, sprawling views from the bay to the Pacific Ocean in the Sky Star Observation Wheel in front of the California Academy of Sciences. It's absolutely breathtaking. Elevate your date night or a night out with friends with a VIP experience that literally no one else can have. Skip the line when you take an extended 
flight of 20 minutes in a VIP gondola with leather seats and hardwood floors. A VIP flight fits up to five people, you guys. You are also going to win a $100 gift card from the Academy store. All right, I see a pledge from Blake of $50. I see a pledge from Drew Taylor, $50. A pledge of $50 from Emily from the California Academy. Thank you all so much. Keep them coming, $50 gets you right into our list here for a to be our virtual hero. Sally Lind, thank you so much. They are coming in. And we have about 30 seconds left. Ike Kwan, thank you so much. It's coming in. You are gonna win this beautiful penguin art and VIP package for Sky Star Wheel. Keep the pledges coming in, you guys. All right, 14, 13, 12. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. I'm doing it my way because I'm seeing them coming at the last minute. I know y'all were going to do this to me. I'm going to start again from 10. 10, 9, 8, Seven, thanks Amy, Nick Hill, Jocelyn, six, five, four, three. All right, Linda, two and one. Out, up, Kathy Estelle. Congratulations, you are our $50 virtual hero. Congratulations. All right, and now we are headed back to Anna, our amazing sand artist, to finish telling you the story of the Academy through her artwork. And then we're gonna visit with Jeremiah again, who will be juggling from our planetarium and aquarium. So cool. Now let's be mesmerized by Anna.
Wow, that was incredible. And I think that amazing performance just put us over the edge. We reached our goal of $200,000. We actually maximized our goal. And now we're at 201.7. So we raised the bar to $225,000, you guys. I am so excited about this. Um, and by the way, I just was thinking about that. Did y'all see um, him juggle with the fish before? That was crazy. Okay, and now you're in for a treat. It is my pleasure to introduce Ryan Wyatt, Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization, who will take you on a tour of the universe. Remember earlier when I asked you where in the universe do you want to go? Ryan is going to take us there. Take it away. Well, good evening and thank you, Micah, for the introduction. Um, it's great to be sharing a little bit of the planetarium. The planetarium has been closed right up until actually today uh, when we started bringing uh, our first guest back into the dome. Uh, so we've been leveraging a lot of the same tools that we use in the planetarium uh, in formats like this. And so it's great to be able to share some of the digital universe that we have inside the planetarium um, through something that's not quite as immersive as our planetarium dome, uh, but is still pretty cool for exploring the universe. So we had a couple of requests. One of those was for the planet Mars. And actually, since Mars has been in the news, uh, I was going to start us out there anyway. So um, we're going to switch to a view of the software that we use in Morrison Planetarium. And that's actually showing us what uh, the Perseverance rover kind of looks like. Uh, but you may, may have heard about the really cool uh, helicopter that's made its first now few flights uh, on Mars. Uh, the Ingenuity helicopter it was kind of a test to see if the technology uh, could work in a weird Martian atmosphere because uh, Mars's atmosphere is only about 1% as dense uh, as the atmosphere on Earth. And so uh, in our little animation here, you see uh, you see Ingenuity's blades running pretty slowly, actually. In fact, uh, they spin at about 40 times a second because the air is so thin on Mars, uh, it needs more lift, uh, more rotations to provide the lift to even hold that four pound helicopter up in flight. We're going to leave uh, engineering and perseverance behind uh, in our kind of representation of Mars. And I'm going to pull away fast enough here uh, so that we can uh, visit the second place on our list. Um, we call this a tour of the universe, but we only have a few minutes, so I can't exactly show you the entire universe. But as we leave Mars and the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter behind, we can see the orbits of uh, two of Mars's moons uh, around the planet. But we're going to pull far enough away now that we're actually seeing the orbit of Mars around the sun. Uh, if you remember from elementary school, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are the inner planets of the solar system. And we either have Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, farther out, we had a request to go visit not just Saturn, but also one of Saturn's moons, Enceladus. And that's actually awesome because Enceladus is, in fact, probably my favorite moon in the solar system. Uh, and I'll tell you why here in a moment. So Mars is, of course, a really interesting place to look for life. And that's the reason the Perseverance rover is actually there right now. It's on Mars to search for chemical signs of life. The helicopter is just kind of a fancy add-on uh, to be able to, uh, to test some technology. But Perseverance will be exploring Mars uh, for uh, chemical evidence of life. And yet, um, and Mars is a great place to look for life because it's relatively close to the, uh, the light and heat of the sun, which makes it a, an excellent uh, place uh, to, to look for where uh, water and energy uh, coincide in our solar system. Uh, to, uh, to provide the kind of important constituents of life. But Saturn here, which was one of our requests, is much farther from the sun. It's a giant planet. We're not gonna really find any life on Saturn, but its moons are a different story. And its moon Enceladus is a particularly interesting spot because Enceladus, and as we approach it, uh, we'll show kind of a high resolution map uh, that was created by the um, Cassini spacecraft because the uh, Cassini spacecraft orbited Saturn for many years uh, and was able to create a high-resolution map of Enceladus. Uh, I'm uh, 
Of course, you've not seen Enceladus, which is a little weird. Uh, Enceladus is a remarkable moon because although it's completely covered in ice, and actually, if you were to look at Enceladus, uh, it is whiter than a snowball. It is the uh, most reflective object in the solar system. And I'm sorry, I uh, seem to be, although we got a good look at Mar uh, Saturn, uh, we didn't seem to get a good look at, at Enceladus. So I'm just going to zip in and zip out and see if we can uh, improve our chances of seeing Enceladus here. Uh, but Enceladus is a fascinating place to look for life because that icy crust actually conceals an under crust ocean, basically an ocean that covers the entire, um, is under the entire uh, surface of the, of the moon. And we actually see plumes of gas coming out of Enceladus. And I have to say, I, um, I didn't double check Enceladus before we started the program. And unfortunately, um, it doesn't seem to be cooperating. So let me actually go ahead and um, take you to another kind of crowd favorite, uh, since uh, uh, since Enceladus is uh, not cooperating for us. Um, and that is, it's not officially a planet, uh, but it is an intriguing object in our solar system, and that is Pluto. Uh, and what we're seeing here is a map of Pluto created by the New Horizons spacecraft, which visited Pluto back in 2015. And what's amazing is that when we first sent the mission out to Pluto, we kind of thought, eh, it's not so far away from the sun. It's probably not the most exciting destination uh, that we could imagine. But in fact, um, Pluto really surprised everyone, even the scientists who were proposing the mission to go there. I'm gonna fast forward time a little bit so we can get a good look at some of Pluto's features. The um, most uh, familiar one is kind of this heart shape uh, in uh, one part of the, of, uh, the dwarf planet's um, surface. This very reflective part of the terrain was visible early on as the New Horizons spacecraft approached Pluto. Uh, and I like to kind of think of it as Pluto's sort of broken heart, uh, maybe for missing out on, the, uh, uh, on being able to uh, be considered a planet anymore. But it turns out that that uh, surface feature is made out of frozen nitrogen. So nitrogen, which is a gas here uh, on uh, on Earth, is frozen to kind of a toothpaste consistency on Pluto and uh, and makes for a really unusual feature on this amazing spot in our solar system. Well, in just a few minutes I have left, or the maybe minute I have left, I'm actually taking you much, much farther away than Saturn or even Pluto. Uh, I'm taking you outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. This is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars of which the sun is just one. And now all the points that you see in the background here are actually individual galaxies. So each point represents a galaxy, perhaps as large as our Milky Way galaxy, perhaps even larger. And I just wanna point out a really kind of interesting place around here. I'm gonna point us off in the direction of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. Uh, and here in the center of the Virgo cluster, we have a, a large image of M87. This is the largest member of the Virgo cluster. Uh, it's several million, tens of millions of light years away, but this, it looks a little bit like just kind of a blur of stars, but there's this intriguing jet kind of pointing out of it, uh, out of the center of the galaxy. And we know that that jet is being fueled by a black hole in the center of the galaxy. And we've actually taken a picture of that black hole. It's a famous image from a few years ago, you might recognize, uh, that shows the silhouette of the black hole. And it was recently updated to show the polarization, which actually shows the magnetic field of the black hole, which is what drives the formation of that jet uh, that we see from much, much farther away. So I just wanted to point that out because we actually, in our current show, Big Astronomy, so if you get a chance to visit Morrison Planetarium in real life, uh, Big Astronomy will tell you how those observations were made and how astronomy happens in Chile. And we're really happy to be welcoming people back into Morrison Planetarium, as long as we're also able to show some of the cool digital universe that we just talked about tonight. So thanks for letting me share a little bit of that with you. And I'll take it back to you, Micah. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was awesome. That was so cool. I feel like I like was totally traveling and I saw someone's comment in the chat box. Karen said, uh, it's nice to travel without a mask. And I was like dying laughing over that. Um, so yes, the universe is so wondrous and incredible. Um, but let's check in real quick and see how tonight's fundraising is going. We are at $205,000.
Thank you so much to everyone who's donated tonight. Your support means so much to us. And I want to give a special shout out to Autodesk. They were originally matching our fundraising tonight at 50K, but doubled their gift to 100K, helping us get to that increased goal of $200,000. And it's still not too late, you guys. We are raising money tonight to help connect people with nature and to provide resources to our staff to help protect biodiversity around the world. And now, streaming from our Philippine coral reef to finish out the evening in the aquarium, here again is Chromio. Romeo. <laughs> And we're back. Chromio the front floors. Springing forward with y'all. Let's go.
vibrations only baby
that was our 2020 anthem right there. I'll be a Clorox wine. I'll be a Clorox wine. I'll be a Clorox wine. I could be a Clorox wine. I would have a purpose. I'll be at your service. Let me wet your surface. Cause that don't make me nervous. I'll be so effective. You won't be effective. I'm not trying to be your man. I'm just your disinfectant. If I could reincarnate tonight, I would be a Clorox wine. Cause I don't win this climate. You mind. Finally, won't be in your life. I'd be a Clorox wine. That was so amazing. The guys wanted me to wish a special happy birthday to Jared from the Academy. So that's from the guys over there. Um, we are gonna be releasing an extended cut of Chromio's DJ set to everyone who tuned in tonight, as well as the full cut from Anna, our sand artist. Uh, we wanna give a special thank you to all of our sponsors tonight and to all of the presenters and entertainers tonight. Thanks so much to you all for tuning in and a special thank you to everyone who donated to the Academy. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. My name is Micah Jesse and it was an honor to be your host tonight. Have a great one. See you next time.